What's up everyone and welcome back to another episode of Healing from the Rough with Next 18. This is going to be part two of our two-part series with Milwaukee firefighter Jeff Gauthier. If you haven't seen the first one, make sure you check it out on our YouTube channel, Healing from the Rough. Um, where we left off last time, in case you missed it, was we were talking to Jeff about his um, battle with PTSD and, and traumas that he has gone through. And uh, we're going to pick it up in this episode uh, where I asked him about what he said in the last episode where he mentioned that if Matt wasn't there, he wouldn't have been able to share his story. Um, he had attended one of Matt's next 18 camps and he got to know and trust Matt. And that just kind of leaves you into uh, a little bit about the traumas and the stigmas that we go through and uh, why we don't talk about it with people that we don't know or trust. So um, make sure you check out part one if you missed it. If not, Welcome to part two, and I hope you enjoy the show. So Jeff, usually this is the hole where we get into the question about the stigmas. You know, you have to be a man, have to, um, you know, act a certain way, be a certain way because of your profession. Um, the last hole, you also said something about trusting Matt, being able to share your story with Matt. Um, and part of the reason we're doing this is to get people to share their stories. Um, because you're comfortable doing it with Matt, the world can kind of see and understand, and not necessarily that they know Jeff now. a little bit on that on, on why it's easy for you to share it with someone like Matt and maybe not the, the average person that's standing in front of you. So I, there's a couple of ways we think about that question when you ask it to you know when you think about difficult times we've talked about it in the past about you know that person at the barbecue that always wants to know oh tell me about the worst thing that you saw or what's the worst thing and that person my initial reaction oftentimes is I'd rather throw a punch him than I tell him a story mm -hmm. and that's not socially acceptable yeah. right so you have one kind of you always have a story kind of chambered up to just kind of get that individual or that personality off your back and you and I having just met like and I understand the context that we're in uh, asking about that it's it's a little bit easier because I I trust and I know Matt a little bit and I know that we want to talk about stigmas, but part of the reason that I, there's two things I think, like number one, I don't want to give that to you. When we talk about, hey, tell us about something that comes up, something that you held on to, those come back fast. And if you haven't dealt with them, they come back in a negative fashion. If I let that out, like I can remember that scene. I can remember the smells. I remember the looks on certain people's faces. I remember the sounds. All those things come flooding back. I remember how hot that fire was. I don't want to give you the specifics of that because I don't want you to have to carry that. I don't want my family to have to carry that. But it's got to go to someone. And so I can talk about that experience with Matt because I went to the camp last year and was made very comfortable right out of the gate and you start to meet people and you go wait you haven't experienced the same things but when I say that was 10 years ago and I remember that smell and the dude next to you goes yep does it, you're, just, you're like oh I don't know what he's smelling or she's smelling but they get it it's helping you can't just look. and so and Matt was the first person I called when I I said hey just uh just finished my first EMDR and you're like, dude, how are you? Yeah. Cool. Yep. You know, so that stigma, I, and now I kind of ramble, I'm sorry, but the part of your, to answer the second half of your question, that stigma, there's things on that fire that happened that it's like, well, I didn't want, I wanted to fix everybody else. I wanted to make sure everybody else was okay. And I didn't want to tell anybody else that I was, that I was hurting, right? And then you just kind of stop and put that in a box because you're like, well, I'm the guy that people come to, so I, I can't say that I need help. And it took a long time to learn that if I can tell other people that I needed help so that I could help them, you know, there was just that stigma. I needed to be the guy that everybody came to, 
didn't, you know, maybe it affected me a little bit, but not much. And I'll be okay. Don't worry about me. Let me take care of you. And by me just trying to take care of everybody else, it also meant that I didn't have to focus on myself. It just made it easier to lock, lock that stuff away. And it's, it's amazing because you said something that most people don't think about. And I don't think I've ever even thought about it was. Um, but you're right. You come home. Like when I came home from Iraq, it was, did you kill it? Did you kill it? And it's right then and there, but I never thought about the fact that you made a point that was, I don't want you to have to carry that. Right? And, and I'm sure, like you said, smells. Like I have my triggers. I'm sure you yep. have your triggers. Certain things with your trauma that all of a sudden it happens. You know, for me, it's loud noises. I've never been able to watch fire. Wherever I am, you know, in the whole month of July is miserable. It's horrible. You know, and everybody, horrible. I have fun, you know, do your thing. But, you know, it's hard for me. I sit in my house and my wife knows it. And she'll look at me and she'll look at me. And, and it's awesome because you finally confide to somebody. But that's the biggest thing. And you said you have to tell somebody, right? And um, and I think that's the biggest thing. So when it comes to the stig stigmas, you know, don't think that way. Don't think, oh, I, I have to be strong, right? You don't. Because there's a million other people out there that are just like you. Seven billion. billion. Right. We're all human. It, Seven billion. And I, like that. We're human. So I think one of the hardest things to learn was that, because I would, the smells would come back or sounds would come back or the louds, like loud sounds never used to bother me until probably about six or seven years ago. And now it's, I just, it doesn't scare me. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is, but the loud door slam, the fireworks, the just, all right, so something changed in me that that doesn't work. But I can't explain that to somebody else. But when that sound just makes you jump or your, your hypervigilance kicks in for a second or whatever it is, to, to say that, to tell somebody else that, hey, that happens. I mean, I thought I was going crazy because I could smell something from 12 years ago. They're like, well, that, that can't happen to normal people. And then started to find out that, hey, that's, that's, your, that's your body trying to give you a wake-up call, number one. But number two, that that happens to what seven million people. So it's okay to say. I mean, so now standing here, I'm like, cool. I can call you on Fourth of July because we'll both be hunkered down someplace, looking quiet, you know, listening to Eric Clapton or something. So, you know. And, and it, you know, for me, if, if I can see it coming, it's one thing. But it's the it's the randomness, you know. It, it's um, you know, and now. Hell, some of these fireworks they make are brutal, you know. And my parents live on the lake, so all the fireworks yeah. are over their house. So we sit in their backyard and watch them. And their neighbors always yep. buy like these half stick of dynamite. Yep. And it's one of those things where you know you want people to know too, though, that when you're going through those things, people don't necessarily have to be scared, right? Like my traumas are mine, right? I wear them, I deal with them, I know how to deal with them. I've dealt with them for 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. It's you know, don't be afraid. Just you know, for for me, it's just let me be for a little, little bit, and we'll be fine. We'll be right back to normal. You know, and I know it's not the same for everybody. Well, and so I've got a friend, and I'll give him credit for the for the phrase. It, it, uh, it's Frank Lito, retired captain from FDNY, and has helped me with a bunch of stuff and taught me a lot about peer support and helping people. And he said, trauma is from within. So th that's. That trauma is mine. Yeah. I'm the only one that knows how bad that is or how I deal with it. And we can have the same aversion to fireworks, but for each of us, it's a little bit different. It's just, it's just not good. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate it. If you're a veteran or first responder who has found a way to heal through golf, or if you work at or own a golf course and would like to be featured on our show, please email me at joseph.malsack at hftr.us. <laughs> All right, so we've, we've talked about the, the stigmas um, and your traumas. How have your traumas affected your friendships and your relationships over, over life? <laughs> um, it would probably, that'd be a better question for my wife. And well, not just your wife. I mean, <laughs> your friendships, your... your um, you know, things with, obviously we know, you know, the people we serve with, it seems to be easier to communicate with. Yeah. It, you know, there might be some new person that comes in who doesn't know, you know, it might be affected. So just overall relationships. I, the circle gets smaller and smaller. It, and it, it's not, 
I have friends outside of the fire service, but that takes intention and work to do. Mm -hmm. You have to actively work on those friendships. I mean, it's hard enough now, everybody's busy, everything's crazy, you know, the world is what it is, but as the less I dealt with anxiety and hypervigilance and, and the things that kind of come with what we get to do, the less I dealt with that, the smaller that circle of friends got, right. both inside and outside of the fire service. And then I didn't want to be around people. Right? So then to me, I would rather just sit in a room, listen to music, isolate. Right? I, I would rather, I, yeah, I would, I would rather isolate. That's just easier. And my relationships, uh, interpersonal and family, and it's just, it just, I know my trigger for me when I feel like, this will sound weird in this setting, but when you start seeing friends or other people and everything just seems like an interview and you want them to just go, just shut up and leave me alone. Right. All right, then I, I'm not doing the things I need to do to take care of me. So we've also got code in our marriage that took a long time to kind of figure out because I'm a little thick-headed. But my wife has been, has been able to figure out, listen, if you're not going to talk to somebody about something or whatever's going on, if you're not going to talk to me, talk to somebody. Right. right? And I've got a short window of when I can be pissy and arrogant and all the sideways crap that comes along and she's pretty good about hey well you need to you know get to a meeting get on your motorcycle and go for a ride and and call somebody and now i mean newer go golf go get out and quit being an asshole it's great that you have that i don't think a lot of yeah i don't think a lot of spouses in general not just in in the communities that right. we're operating in, I think, in general, I know a lot of that comes down to communication. And it's... Right? Right. Talking to your partner and saying, hey, we're going to be together a long time. Let's have some understanding of, you know, when I need something, these are my words. These are to identify so that you know, hey, I'm moving from rational to emotional. I'm not going to respond in a probably a good way but I'm giving you a trigger word or two like hear it and respect it and don't push me past past because then it's all emotional and how often does that turn out positive? And, and and that took I mean it wasn't like we stepped into it and that just started working that took a lot of years yeah of yeah. trying to figure things out on on both sides mostly mine but <laughs> well, you, <laughs> you know, know like you said that you know you said this would sound weird in this setting but it really seems like an interview but like now that you've gone to one of Matt's camps and you've started to kind of find ways around, you know, the setting, has it been easier for you to, to have those relationships and not want to isolate? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you, maybe there's a better clinical term, but I'm an extroverted introvert. Ambivert. If that, is that a, Ambivert. right? So like this coming okay. up, we brought him along. that's why we bring him along. <laughs> I'm looks, he's brains. Um, but they, if I if I work if I'm doing the other things in my life that I need to do to kind of stay at this level, then everything else is a little bit easier. So that if you are going out to be with friends or are, that it's that's not automatically anxiety driven, or you're not pushing away or not trying to isolate. Uh, but it means that I have to be doing other things in my life calling Matt or calling somebody and saying, hey, today's just a crappy day, man. I don't know why it's just a crappy day. And being okay doing that, that's a, you know, that's a big deal. I've really learned that a lot this year, and that's a lot of self-care. And it's and being, being okay knowing that you can ask for that is, like, mind-blowing this past year. Right. Yeah. And having... You know, you work at the fire department. Right. I have a close relationship with Chief Lipsky. I understand that he, if you're in a work environment and you have someone that is above you as a boss or a supervisor that buys into the mental health. Absolutely. I mean, that makes a, psychologically, you're going to, you're here or here because 
you know your boss cares about your well-being and without a doubt being able to say hey i need a day chief lipsky's gonna give you that right probably right whereas some professions and some bosses they're like the stigmas suck it up suck it up we're fine keep it moving cool great well when i burn out and you know take right the path that we all know that exists in our community is thanks for being there yep and I think the big thing, like with that day, or what what does that day mean, or what is like Chief understands it, but that day also has to come with action. Yes, it can't just be laying it can't on the be, couch. And I learned that. And I learned that the hard way, yeah. right? That that's it takes it takes action steps to go with that too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So Jeff, how has, um, after we've had all this conversation, we've talked about all these things and, and traumas and things like that, how has the game of golf helped you find an outlet to deal with the traumas that you have in life? It's, it's not a way that I would have, you know, I didn't know what to expect, especially coming into the camp. Uh, we've talked about just little skills, like, like just the little things that we learned that made it more approachable to me. It's, I'm not I'm not an athlete. It's not something I did growing up, but you know, success begets success, right? Or I took one little victory. What it's done, actually I kind of forgot it to now, but I told it to Matt at one time. Came out to the camp, learned, some, learned breathing and did some of the yoga and different things. And then how, how do we put that into my everyday life? And like, mm -hmm. it convinced me to meditate more changed my meditation routine from when I was anxious to um, starting a day with a meditation rather than being reactive. Uh, the breathing, how we approach the ball, just kind of doing the same thing every time when you do that, that works in my brain, mm -hmm. right? That makes sense to me when you approach yeah. it like that. So then, but the mental aspect of just taking a minute and letting everything just be gone so that you don't think about any, that's been the most fun, is that even if it's that five seconds standing there where, before you're about to hit, everything else is gone. Yeah. And that's a piece that I don't get. And I didn't realize that was there until I went for a hike, probably six months after camp, and meandering around, it took us to a golf course, and I stepped onto a golf course, and I like was instantly at peace. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That is amazing. I, and we talk uh, about it all the time, you know, every time we, we mention or even bring up this question, you know, you just look, I mean, look behind us, you know, and, and there's obviously a lot more picturesque golf courses than the one we're on, um, but I mean, anything, you know, there's nothing here, birds, you, you, you know, wind, you know, there's some cars over here, but for the most part, most of the time you're out in the middle of nowhere, it's peaceful, you don't have to worry about answering your phone or responding to a text. You just live in the moment and it's fantastic. I feel like, we're, and now this place is kind of special because this is where we were. I mean, I remember the conversations we had here mm -hmm. with the group of guys, but when we talk about, we talked before about the smells and the sounds and everything, but like, okay, but those birds in the background, the way the wind's going, the, the, the smell here now, those, it's not gonna take all the bad stuff away but there's more of the good stuff there, right? Yeah. We talk about filling the cup, like new sounds, new there's new sounds. sounds. It's like, this is a good. And it's a calming. It's, it's different from the trauma, yeah. you know, smells and sounds. It's it's a calming right. smell and sound. And it's it, something you can repeat by just yep. coming out here and paying a few bucks and swinging a club. And I'm horrible at golf. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. But this is awesome. And that's why this is, I mean, rough because, yeah. you know, we're, we spend most of our time in the rough. We're not pro golfers, yeah. but you know, We've lived our lives in the rough, we play golf in the rough, yeah. and we enjoy every minute of it. Yeah, I wouldn't trade this for anything. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. All right, Jeff, well, first of all, thank you for all your time today. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely, thank uh, you, guys. Getting to know you a little bit more, uh, getting to know your story. Um, it's, it's been fantastic, and we do appreciate you sharing everything you did. Um, at the end here, we like to have a little bit of fun. Okay. So we got a 25-question speed round. <laughs> Don't okay. think too hard. Right? All right. 
no, that's, no, no answer is a dumb answer, right? So firefighter on a um, truck, it's not. Spit it out, all right? <laughs> um, but uh, Matt will go through and just give us your answer. Okay. All right, buddy. Oh, go. I don't like that look. <laughs> Texting or talking? Talking. Last song you downloaded? Oh, be, uh, it's between the Barry to me, and I can't remember the death metal. <laughs> Favorite holiday? Thanksgiving. How long does how long does it take you to get ready? Ten minutes. Is it wrong for a vegetarian to eat animal crackers? Not at all. Place you most want to travel? Italy. Favorite food? Spaghetti. Say a word in Spanish. Muy piquito. That's a lot of words. Do you wear <laughs> socks with sandals? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is double dipping at a party ever acceptable? Yes. Godfather or Scarface? Scarface. Scale of 1 to 10, how good are you at wiffle ball? <laughs> 1. <laughs> Ideal outside temperature? 84 degrees with about 40% humidity. How many stuffed animals do you sleep with? None. How many spritzes of cologne is too much? <laughs> One. Ask permission or beg for forgiveness? <clears throat> beg for forgiveness. What is a triangle with two sides called? <laughs> An L. Climb a mountain or jump from a plane? Jump from a plane. Lose your hair or gain 50 pounds? Yeah, okay. Well, there is a bug in your house. Kill it or set it free? Set it free. One food you could eat every meal? Pasta. Would you fly into space? Yeah. Twizzlers or red vines? Red vine. Who inspires you? Oof. That's, that's a lot of people do. Top of your mind. My wife. Finally, golf course you want to play the most? I don't know golf courses well enough. Another foursome with you guys. All That's right. the course I want to be on. Thanks for coming out today, yeah, man. Thank really you. appreciate it. It's no, good seeing you. Thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much for your time. Far better. And that concludes our series with Jeff. I really hope you guys enjoyed all of the content. Please make sure you leave comments. Uh, give us any questions you would like us to ask going forward. I can't promise that you'll get the answers that you want, uh, but we'll definitely try to ask the questions. Um, any feedback, anything that you would want to see from us going forward. Um, you know, at the end there was, was a little emotional for me and Matt. You know, we ask a lot of people uh, the, the speed round questions. And the last question is, what golf course do you want to play the most? And obviously, knowing that uh, Jeff's pretty new to this, um, and he's just kind of picking up his journey with golf, is uh, his, his answer was that any round with, with the four of us that were with him and... Uh, Jeff, we'd love to play another round with you anytime. You can call me. Uh, I feel like I made a lifelong friend in you, and uh, we loved our time together. I hope to see you soon. And for everybody out there, keep watching for next week's episode. Thanks, and have a good one.